That's a lot of love, right, yeah. sir? <laughs> Well, I want to thank God for this beautiful day that He gave us today. Thank you for waking me up and giving me breath to bring you today. Uh, thank you for saving me. For, uh, I thank you that the children are saved. Yes, amen. And, and I, just, uh, I, I know that someone called me this week and they said, you know, well, their two children didn't come to see him on Father's Day and all this. And they said, you know, maybe I was too rough on them. Maybe I did this and maybe I did that. I said, when you have a baby, you don't come with a manual. That's it, I mean, or a how-to manual. You just do the best that you, that you can do, and then you just leave the rest to God. And I just want to praise God, and I want to thank you that my kids are all saved, that they, through His grace, through His grace only, they grew up to be wonderful adults. And I just want to praise you and thank you for everything you guys do. Say 104 in the blue book. Oh. 
Lord God, I just thank you ever so much, Father, for Jesus and all that he has done, dear Lord God. Father God, had given himself for our sin, dear Lord God. And Father, that he gave us life more abundant, Father. Lord, I praise you, Father God, Lord, for your holiness, dear Lord God, for your righteousness, Father, for your almighty perfect judgment, Father God. And Lord, I just want to thank you, Father God, for who you are. Lord God, that you've allowed us to gather today, Father, in your name, Father God. Lord, I praise you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, dear Lord God, who's here in the midst of us, Father God. Lord, I praise you that, that dear Lord God, he's with us everywhere we go, Father God. Lord, I thank you for your anointing, Father God, Lord, knowing that you're inside of my heart, dear Lord God. And Lord, that you guide my footsteps and you guide my words. And dear Lord God, that you take it, my thoughts into, into control, Father God. And Lord, I praise you for that, my Father. Lord God, I thank you ever so much for your word, dear Lord, that we're about to receive. Father God, Lord, it is the bread of life. And Father, I praise you ever so much, Father God, Lord, for using Robin as a vessel, dear Lord, for using my lips, dear Lord, as a vessel, dear Lord God. And, and dear Lord God, giving the songs to sing, dear Lord God, that's just an echo and a shadow and a type of the glory to come in heaven with you, Father. And Lord, I just want to thank you ever so much, Father God, Lord, for you preparing a place for us. And and Lord God, I pray for the request, dear Lord. You know the desires of our hearts. And dear Lord God, I just praise you for your word that you told us that if we would delight ourselves in you, dear, dear Lord, that you would give us the desire of our heart, dear Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you that truly that desire is Jesus Christ, our Savior, dear Lord, and salvation from on high, Father. And Lord God, I just pray, dear Lord, most of all, that you would help us to be a light and a testimony to this world, dear Lord, a light and a, and a testimony to the lost, dear Lord God, that you might help us, dear Lord, to preach the gospel boldly, that you would help us that wherever we go, Father God, Lord, that our light would shine, dear Lord, among men, that they might realize who you are, Father God, Lord, that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, dear Lord, and Lord God, that they would not perish in a devil's hell. And Father God, Lord, I just praise you for that, dear Lord. I just praise you that you are the all-sufficient God, that you are El Shaddai, and that, Father God, Lord, that you are my shepherd, and dear Lord, I shall not want, Father, for Lord, you provide everything I need. And Father, I just want to thank you for that this morning. I praise you, my Holy Savior God, Lord, for the privilege, dear Lord, that we can come this morning. Help us, dear Lord, to trust more wholly in you, dear Lord God, that, Father God, Lord, that we might walk in your power, and in your glory. Father, I pray, help Bob and Gail and the church that they've went to, dear Lord. Help them, dear Lord God, to be blessed, dear Lord. And most of all, help them to be a blessing, dear Lord. And Father, I give you all the praise for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. And amen. Have you seen number 64? Just over in the glory land. 
been just over in the glory land. With the blood of water strong, I will shout and sing, just over in the glory land. Glad to send us to Christ the Lord and King, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory just over in the glory land, there with the mighty ghost I'll stand. Just over in the glory land.
know how to get there. They know how to get there. So they don't just say, well, I guess it's this way. They know. Right. Um, now, we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, do we? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Do you know who does? Who does? God knows what's going to happen tomorrow, doesn't he? So he's our map maker. And he is, we need to go to him in prayer so that we know which roads to take, so that we know what decisions to make. You know, like Maria's talking about, you know, she's been offered a job. But she doesn't know if that's God's plan for her. So she is seeking him. She's praying and asking him to guide her. You know, I don't want to make the make my choice. I want to make the choice that you have for me. Because God always does things that are right for us, doesn't he? He's not going to lead us to doing something that's going to hurt us. So he, I mean, he loves us. So we need to, to go to him and ask us, ask him, you know, what direction, what do you want me to do? What's your decision for me? Um, now, how do we pray? We, uh, there's a, a verse, a, or a memory verse, is, um, Turn to Matthew chapter 6. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse, start at verse 9. We're going to listen for, we're 
quickly turn, turn to some more verses. Autumn, I want you to find Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Ray, I want you to find Luke chapter 5, verse 16. 3,
he went up into a what? Jesus was a busy man. He was he was a busy man. He was always doing something. <clears throat> but did he make time to pray? He made time to pray. Um, he would go off by himself and he would pray. He, that was a priority to him. Um, he prayed regularly. He knew that he needed a partner um, who could direct his steps through his life. Who was his partner? Bible, it shows us every time before he ate, he prayed. Mm -hmm. every, I mean, when, when the multitudes, when he fed the 5,000, he prayed. And, when, and, and, and the night before he was crucified and he had the last supper with his, with his disciples, he prayed. He always prayed before he ate. Um, no. So God was Jesus' partner. Is God our partner? Yes, he's our partner. It's just as important for us to keep in close contact with God as it was for Jesus to keep in close contact with Him. Um, <clears throat> now, what's the time? I want y'all to think of a time that you could pray regularly. Do you pray regularly? We pray before we eat, but is there another time when you can pray by yourself? Um, nighttime? Think of a time when you would like to. Because we're gonna we're gonna um, start a, a you know a regular we're gonna get into a into a habit of praying, have set aside a certain time of day to pray every day. Night is that your good time? Okay. Because um, we have we all have times when we do certain things. We brush our teeth every day, right? We brush our teeth before we go to bed. We brush them when we get up. Um, we have, that's a priority. That's an important thing. I don't let you forget to brush your teeth, do I? I sort of nag you about it. To brush your teeth, not to brush your teeth. Um, because, you know, if you want to brush your teeth, your teeth fall out, right? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I want us to, to look at prayer as being just, a, you know, it's way more important than brushing your teeth because if your teeth fall out, you know, you can go get false teeth. But, you have to you have to maintain a prayer life. You have to be in contact with God every day. Um, so, uh, what about a place? What's a, what's a place that you might 
like to set aside <laughs> for your prayer place. Okay. Okay, your bed. Where else would you pray? I always got a kick out of thermal um, out of Heiser Creek. She would mow grass yeah. and she that was her prayer time. And she she'd get on her mower and she mow grass and that was her time to talk to the Lord. Because yeah. she couldn't hear anything else besides a lawnmower running. You know, she could listen to God's voice. Um, what about you all? Is there a, a place, your bed, what's another place you want to think of? We can have your side. Outside. Maybe on the tire swing or on the um, swing out back or on the porch. thing we should do when we pray. What's the, the first part of our prayer? Well, the Lord's Prayer, what did He do? What was the first part of it? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he praised God the very first thing, didn't He? So that's the way we need to start our prayers. We need to praise God. 
don't just uh, say, Heavenly Father, I need something. You know, don't do that. Praise Him. Praise Him. Hmm. Yeah. And all I want you to do today is write, you know, write one prayer on one page. If you have others, you know, I can give you more paper. But I want you to at least write one.
Amen. One of my favorite times to pray is in the morning. Yes. <laughs> Before I, I do anything, I, I've often woke up praying. I just woke up. Be praying in my sleep and wake up praying. And I thank God for that confirmation. You know, before a soldier would go into battle, he would prepare for battle. And we're in a battle every day. And I want to be prepared. And I thank God for the opportunity to be prepared. I don't have to go unprepared. God thoroughly furnishes us. He gives us everything we need. And then some. Amen. Psalm 63 says, O oh God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see Thy power and Thy glory so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. Because Thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise Thee. I will bless Thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in Thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise Thee with joyful lips. When I remember Thee upon my bed and meditate on Thee in the night watches, because Thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of Thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for the foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speaketh lies shall be stopped. I praise God. That everything that God says is true. Amen. He said, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. I am so glad for my Savior that all that He says and all that He does is honest, it's true, it's pure, and it's holy, and it will come to pass. I'm so glad that God can't lie. Right. The, Lord, uh, the Lord has given me a message this morning. Uh, it's on my favorite chapter in the Bible. Uh, this is this is by far. I love all of the Scripture because all of the Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But I love Hebrews chapter nine. Hebrews chapter nine is like a mini Bible in itself because it gives everything from the law of Moses to God preparing a place in heaven. And I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad for the for the for the for the, the truth in God's Word. And uh, when, when, when I began to study Hebrews chapter 9, I, I was so blessed uh, when I was first saved. And, and uh, it, it, it encouraged me so much. And I always find something new and blessed in Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, it, it, is, it is such a wonderful uh, scripture. And, uh, and I thank God. I thank God for it. So turn with me if you would. To Hebrews chapter 9 and we're going to read a, a section from Hebrews chapter 9 and uh, if, if you've not studied this chapter I encourage you uh, to study it wholly and uh, and, and, to, and to seek out uh, the, the, the meanings of, of everything in this chapter because it is such a blessing uh, to, to have it revealed uh, to us but we're going to we're going to begin reading at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. One of my favorite parts of, of, this, of this chapter. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testate, testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And let's, let's pray together. Father Almighty, my Creator, my Redeemer, and my Holy Savior, I praise you, Almighty God, for the privilege, dear Lord, to be able to pray, to be able to stand here, Father God, today in your presence and, Father, proclaim your truth. I thank you, Father God, Lord, for these words that you let us read. I thank you for the meaning inside of our hearts, Father, that you reveal to us. Father, I pray, help us, dear Lord, to trust more fully in Jesus. Help us, dear Lord God, that our eyes would be opened and our hearts would understand. Father, I pray, use my lips that I might be a blessing to you and a blessing to your people. And I give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And amen. The Word tells us here about that Christ became a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. And it's not made with hands. It's not of this building. A lot of folks would like to think or believe that, the, that a church is, a, is, a, is the place where God is. But brother, I want you to know that God is everywhere at all times. That God's presence is everywhere and at all times, but God's anointing is upon those who are in fellowship with Him. Fellowship with God. I'll give you an example. If you go somewhere and there is someone at, at that place in particular who is very well known, say it's the President of the United States, say it's someone famous, and you go to that place, well, you are around the presence of that person, correct? Because you're at that place. And that's the way God is. God is everywhere at all times, and you're in God's presence no matter where you are at. Whether you're in the night, God is there. The light shines as the darkness to Him. The darkness and the light are both alike to Him. But brother, there's one thing, there's something different about being in the presence of God and having God's presence. It's fellowship. You might go to that place where that person is, and you might be around that person, but brother, are you in fellowship with that person? In other words, do you talk to that person and tell that person the very in, in, the most intimate thoughts of your heart? You see, brother, that is, that is fellowship. And that's the anointing of God. When God's anointing is there with you, brother, it's not that His presence is just all around. It's that He is there in your heart and you can talk with Him. It's not of this building. That's right. Amen. Christ has become a high priest of good things to come uh, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. That is to say, not of this. But this is the temple of the Holy Ghost now. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing, amen, that hallelujah, that we become the house of God. That God dwells in us, not made 
with hands. That's what the Scripture is telling us here. And glory be to God, it tells us that it's not by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood. He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Brother, uh, it, it, this blesses me so much. And, it, and I tell you, I, I, I felt like dancing the first time that I ever got a hold of it. And it tells us here that, 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 uh, that Christ, that He was uh, where a testament is in verse 16, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So, and for instance, say your father, say your earthly father, not your creator, your earthly father, made a will and testament out. And that last will and testament says certain things in it that you are to receive when he passes on. That is what a testament is. It's of no effect while he lives. It's, it's there and it's, and it's a will and testament that sits there and it's, and, it's, and it's written down, but it's not enforced until he passes on. Amen? So that's what the scripture says where a testament is, there must also a necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So, so the New Testament, it is a covenant from God. When we, think, when we say the New Testament of the Bible, we say that lightly a lot of times. Well, it's just a section in the Bible. But it's more than that. It is the new covenant by God Almighty. It is the new it is the new will and testament of God. Hallelujah. And brother, it was necessary. It was absolutely 100% undeniably necessary for Jesus to die. It was necessary for him to die. Or otherwise the testament would not have been in force. It would not have been enforced. The Bible said, glory be to God. I'm so glad this scripture right here, it goes along with what we were talking about in Romans. It says that while they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is where we get the Lord's Supper from. This is where we get communion from. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus said Himself that my blood is the New Testament. My blood is the new covenant that God has made. God's made many covenants. Amen. If you read through the Bible, what was one of the first covenants that God made? It was the covenant of the rainbow. God said, I won't flood the earth anymore. I won't destroy it with water anymore. And His covenant was given. He gave a sign, didn't He? The sign of the rainbow. Glory be to God. That's a sign of His covenant. Hallelujah. Now that's, that's a promise. You know, when God makes a promise, God will often show something to prove His promise. As glory be to God, the Bible uh, uh, told us there when he, uh, King Hezekiah had prayed and he said, Lord, uh, and he the Bible said that he was, he was going to die. And the Bible said that he turned to the wall and he wept bitterly. And the Bible said, the Lord said, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Amen. For you to be a blessing is what he added it to Hezekiah. God said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to prove to you that, my, that your prayer has been answered. God moved the sun back 10 degrees. God moved the sun. Did you know He'll move heaven and earth to answer your prayer? I'm telling you, brother, there's power in the blood. I said there's power in the blood. <laughs> there's power in the blood of the Lamb. And brother, when you pray, that was under the old covenant, brother Jim, when Hezekiah prayed. That was under the Old Testament. But brother, we're talking about a New Testament. 
We're talking about power in the blood of God Almighty. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You know what God says, God's going to do it. What God says, brother, you can write it down, you can count on it, you can believe it, you can hide it in your heart, you can trust on it, you can pray on it. What God says, He will do. I will make a new covenant. This is prophesied 700 years before Jesus came. 700 years before God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And it says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the east, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. You know what, brother? You know what's wonderful about being saved? You know what's one of the most greatest blessings of being saved? Is, brother, I no longer know about God, but I know Him personally. I know Him personally. Amen. I tell you that He is my Father. I tell you that He is my friend. Amen. I am the friend of God Almighty. God gives us His Wisdom. That's what the Bible says right here. It says they shall, they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. That means from the youngest to the eldest. Amen. It's, it's, it's a blessing. Amen. That even a child, even a child knows the ways of the Lord when they're saved. I remember when Ray Ray was saved. And brother, there was a change in him. There was a change in the way he acted and the way he talked. And, and I can still see it today, the change in him. It's a blessing, amen. It's a blessing. The Bible says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Amen. You say, Brother Troy, what kind of wisdom are you talking about? Paul said, and I, brethren, when I came unto you, I came not declaring unto you the, uh, the, the wisdom of men. Uh, it, it, the, the Bible says that, uh, he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said that I wasn't, in, I wasn't concerned about the wisdom of man. He says, I was concerned about the wisdom of God. He says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That power of God is Jesus Christ. You want to know what wisdom is? It's the wisdom of God. It's the wisdom of God's covenant that He has given to His people. That is the wisdom that He's talking about. He says... He says, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Not of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He says, but as it is written, I hath not seen, and ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love them. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, that we might freely know, that know the things that are freely given to us by God. Brother, the wisdom that God gives is the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and, and, and His his, his precious covenant that He has given us. And brother, we don't need to go to some other person and say, am I saved? Am I doing what's right? Do I need to go and, 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 and go to another man? That's what Jeremiah is saying here. He says, this new covenant, 
I don't need to go to a man and ask that man to tell me what the truth is. Because God takes the truth, which is Jesus Christ, and He puts Him in our heart. Uh, and glory be to God. Uh, hallelujah. We trust on Him and what He has given us through His precious covenant. That's the covenant that God promised would come. And that's the promise that came in Jesus. Jesus is that New Testament. Jesus is that with Him dying and giving us that testament and that testament being enforced, God gave us the promise which was the Holy Spirit. That we no longer need to say, well, I know of God. I know about God. No, I know Him personally. Amen. I have fellowship with Him. I talk with Him. I walk with Him. And you know what? He tells me and I'm his own. What a blessing. Brother, it doesn't get better than that. Right. It does not get better than that. Right. This new covenant God promised us. Now the Bible tells us here, and if we're not careful, I love the King James Bible. Amen. Now there's many other uh, interpretations of God's Word, but brother, I love the way that the King James Bible is written. If you're not careful, God tells us that it is important for us to study that we might show ourselves approved. The Bible says, A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, brother, am I saying that you must study the Bible to be saved? No, I'm not telling you that. But what I am telling you is that if you are going to be blessed, if you are going to walk in the power and the authority of God Almighty, you need to study the Bible. Right. You need to study it to show your approved, self approved unto God, not to man. Show yourself approved unto God. If you study the Bible and, brother, you seek Him, uh, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul followeth hard after thee. My flesh longeth for thee as in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. God, His Holy Spirit is that water. And He is refreshing as cold waters to a thirsty soul. So it's good news from a far country. God's Word will encourage you. God's Word will empower you. It is important to study God's Word. It is important to know the meanings. Brother, if you don't understand something, you know what God has thoroughly equipped you and I. I mean, I, I, I'm getting real here today, okay? Because I want you to know you can go on the internet and you can go on the Blue Letter Bible. You can go on, brother, countless thousands and tens of thousands of websites and you can study the Bible. You can go on there and you can find every word in the Greek. You can find every word in the Hebrew. And brother, I want you to know that, uh, that hallelujah, that things were, were written in this old style English for a reason. God wants you to seek Him with all of your heart. He says, when you seek me with all of your heart, then ye shall find me. Amen. God wants you to seek Him and to seek His Word. And I tell you that if you'll study His Word, glory, hallelujah, God will bless you. You don't study His Word to be saved. You study His Word to be strengthened and encouraged, prepared. God has thoroughly furnished us. To whom much is given, much is required. How many of you have more than one Bible in your house? Amen. We've been thoroughly furnished, haven't we? <laughs> Hallelujah. He's given us much. He's given us much. Glory be to God. So Moses here, the Bible tells us in the Hebrews chapter 9, it's, it, he tells us that there, uh, in verse 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Now if we're not careful in studying that one line of Scripture, someone could think that there is another way to be purged other than by blood. But what God is talking about here is he's talking about the vessels, the, 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 the things, the, the inanimate objects of the, of the temple, of the tabernacle. And so these things were in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. 
in the book of Numbers, these things God commanded them that these things should be purified. Now we know that the Old Testament, that hallelujah, that the tabernacle of the Old Testament is a type of us. That it's a type of purification. Brother, when you get saved, glory be to God, I am so glad that He does not stop working on you. But brother, he'll, he'll cleanse this part of you and He'll cleanse that part of you. And He'll put this part through the fire and He'll put this part through the flood. But He said, I'll be with you through the fire and I'll be with you through the flood. Uh, glory be to God. He is helping us to become more like Jesus every day. Amen. Praise if you're submissive to Him. But the Bible says here that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. If we look at the... At the, at the uh, context of this scripture most the Bible is taking and, and it's and it's showing the allegory between Moses and the law and Christ it's showing the shadow of the things to come that were in Moses to Christ because remember this book is written to the Hebrews it's written to people who know about the law of God Amen. And when you get into the law of God and you study about the law of God and you realize what kind of a sinner that you are, glory be to God, and then you see what Jesus did. It, hallelujah. Woo, you can't hold it in. Yeah. It's a blessing. And glory be to God. Uh, Moses, is he, God is telling him, uh, he, he's showing about how that in num here in Numbers it says this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses, only the gold and silver, the brass, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that may abide the fire, he shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation, and all that abideth not the fire, he shall make go through the water. So there were some things, things that were made of metal type substances, they were made to go through the fire. And they were purified for the sanctuary. It had to be clean. Amen. God doesn't dwell in a dirty place. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Uncleanness is not godliness. Right? So God wanted things clean. He wanted things right. That's just like the inside of us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Amen. So glory be to God. He, the Bible says that He will set as a refiner and He will purify the sons of Levi. So God will allow us to go through the fire. You know what the fire is? It's the Word of God. Every man's work should be tried of what sort it is, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen. And the fire shall try. My God is a consuming fire. Amen. It's not by word like unto a fire and a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces is what Jeremiah said. God's word is the fire that, that, that purifies us. God's word is the water that cleanses us. And almost all things, so we see the types and the shadows, but what he's talking about here in Hebrews 9 and 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. There were some things in the sanctuary some things in the tabernacle that could be cleansed, purified by fire and water. Amen? Which was the word. And uh, as, as we are saved, once we are saved, then God begins to work on us with His word. That's why you need to study God's word. Because He will per perfect that which concerneth you. God will take His Word and He will purify and He will cleanse you and, uh, and, and He'll... But brother, you must be saved first. God can't work on you unless you're saved. God can't help you with His Word unless you are saved. You must be saved before God's Word will have any effect to you. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that the carnal mind is not subject unto the law of God Neither indeed can it be. So your flesh is not subject to the law of God. It will not become into subjection to God's Word. You must be saved. And when you are saved, then you will become into subjection to the Word of God. And the Word of God can work on you. Hallelujah. Philippians 1 and 6. Being confident of this very thing that He that has begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Christ. God works on you. And it's a blessing. And sometimes that work and that surgery and that operation isn't pleasant. 
But glory be to God, we know that it's for God's glory. So, there's some things that were purified by water, some things that were purified by fire, and in Hebrews 9 and 22, that's what he's saying here, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. But there's one thing that cannot be purged with fire. There's another thing that cannot be purged with water. It takes blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Sin cannot be purged by the Word of God. Sin cannot be purged by the Holy Spirit. You must be saved and then the Holy Spirit can work on you. You must be saved and then the Word of God can work on you. Brother, the only way for you to get saved is the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now those things were purged in the temple with fire and with water. But brother, the only way that someone could be forgiven of sin, blood had to be shed. There was no other way. It couldn't, you, couldn't put up, you couldn't take a golden offering like Nebuchadnezzar did that was made of fire and offer it up. You couldn't do that for sin. You couldn't take, you couldn't take no amount. There had to be blood shed by the priest. The priest had to shed blood in order to be forgiven of sin. God said, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and God clothed them with animal skin. God made the first sacrifice in the Garden of Eden. God gave them and covered their sin. They tried to do it with fig leaves when they sewed them together. And when Cain and Abel brought their offerings to God, the Bible said that God had respect unto Abel's offering, but to Cain's he did not have respect. And the Bible said that Cain's countenance was wroth. The Bible said he became wroth. And God says, why has your countenance fallen? He rose up and he slew his brother. The Bible says that he that, that, that Abel brought the first ones of his flock. But the Bible says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Now, brother, I believe that Cain's offering was beautiful. I believe it was the very best that he could possibly give. I don't think that it was some kind of a halfway kind of offering. I bet it was beautiful. I bet it was a beautiful offering of fruits and flowers and and think, imagine how beautiful it was back in those days before there was so much corruption, so much pollution, so much pestilence that's went rampant for thousands of years. Imagine how beautiful. It must have been a beautiful sight, His offering. But God gave the example through His mommy and daddy that it took blood. It took an animal dying. It took blood for sin to be forgiven. Glory be to God, he had respect to Abel's offering. The Bible says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. God testifying of his works, and by it he being dead yet spoke. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. His blood cried from the ground. His blood cried out to God Almighty, his Father. I tell you, brother, it's wonderful. Brother, the remission means the act of remitting, release as from a debt, penalty, or obligation, forgiveness, or pardon. It took blood. It's always taken blood, and it always will take blood. There's no other way that a man can be saved. There's no other way. That, because, brother, it took the precious blood of Christ, God sending the very best that He could, the very best that God could bring. The Bible prophesied in Genesis 22 when Abraham took Isaac up to the, the Mount Moriah, the very same mountain that Jesus was crucified on. Uh, uh, hallelujah, 2,000 years later. Uh, and glory be to God. Uh, uh, brother, uh, he said, Father, here's the wood and here's the fire. But Father, where's the sacrifice? And he said, Son, God will provide Himself a lamb. Amen. Himself. God Himself will come as a lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. Brother, it's a blessing. 
that sin is remitted. It's paid for. It's forgiven. Brother, there's no amount of church attendance. There's no amount of reading the Bible. There's no amount of gift giving. There's no amount of working or trying to abstain from sin that you can do to be saved. There's only one way. It's through the shedding of blood. Brother, uh, I don't believe that Jesus, I don't believe that Jesus was killed involuntarily. Jesus, Jesus and God premeditated Jesus' death on the cross. It was premeditated. If the princes of this world knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But I want you to know that it wasn't just the princes of this world who crucified Jesus. Primarily, it was God. God crucified Jesus. Psalm 22 says, Thou hast brought me unto the dust of death. He was compassed with dogs. The Bible says the dogs are, dogs are likened to the Gentiles. He was surrounded by Gentiles, the Trojan army, the Trojan Romans. The Roman Trojans were there. He was surrounded by the council. They were there. But in Psalm 22, the prophecy of the cross, it is the most perfect, beautiful picture of the cross you'll ever read in the Bible. Psalm 22. Way before Jesus was here, it was prophesied. He says, Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Who's thou? He's speaking to God in Psalm. He's speaking to God and He says, Thou hast brought me. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. God ordained it before the world. That we speak the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Hallelujah. Before this world was made, Oh, Brother Jim, it's such a blame. Before this world was even created, God said, Son, you're going to go and you're going to die for them. It was the plan before God spoke this world into existence. Did you know who the beginning of the creation is? Read in Revelation chapter 1, the beginning of the creation of God is Jesus. The beginning of the creation is Christ. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word became flesh and us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's beginning of creation was not this world. It was not the stars and the moon. It was not light. It was Christ. God said before there was light. God said, let there be light. When God said, that was the Word of God. He created Christ. It was ordained before the world unto our glory. It was premeditated. That's why it says, without shedding of blood is no remission. His blood was not spilled. It was not an accident. It was not something that happened to Him by chance. The Bible will tell us of often times when Jesus would do a miracle when He healed the blind man, He said, don't go and tell anybody who I am. His time had not yet come. He said to His mother, Mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time has not yet come. He didn't want them to know who He was ahead of the time. The Bible said that they took Him the first time He ever preached and they went to throw Him off the hillside. Because they were convicted by His Word. The Bible says He walked through the midst of them because His time had not yet come. So Jesus, His death on the cross was prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15, 3, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way in Jeremiah 31. It was prophesied and here He had came and He preached it to His disciples. He says, I'm telling you this so that when it comes to pass, you'll know that I'm Him. You'll know that I'm the Christ. Because I'm telling you it now. And they wouldn't understand. They would not understand. 
Brother, you have a greater hope today than even they had who walked with Jesus. Do you hear me today? You have a greater hope and a greater covenant than those who walked shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. Because He was on the outside. He was on the outside there beside Him. He's no longer on the outside. He's inside. Amen. He's inside of us. His Holy Spirit fills our heart. He anoints us with oil that our cup runs over. Yeah. Glory be to God. Jesus said in John 10, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. <laughs> Jesus said this. In John 10, the, 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 the chapter of the Good Shepherd, he says the shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But the wolf, but the hireling, when he sees the wolf coming, he flees because he's a hireling. Jesus was not a hireling. He's the Good Shepherd. Brother, uh, it's necessary for us to have the blood of Christ in our life daily because of the sin that we have in our life. We, we are born into sin. I asked my children on the way here this morning, I said, did you know that you were born into sin? When you were born into this world, you, were born, you weren't born in the image of God. You were born in the image of Adam. Adam was made in the image of God until he sinned. You were born in the image of Adam. When you get born again, you bear the image of God. When you get born again by the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And brother, there's a second Adam that came that you might bear the image of the heavenly and not the image of the earthy, but the image of the heavenly. Brother, the Bible says that in Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You know, the, the sweetest kid that I've ever met, and I'm not trying to be partial here, the sweetest kid I've ever met, I, his head's probably going to get this big and he's going to fall over, is Ray Ray. I love Ray Ray with all my heart. He is sweet as can be. He is a sweet little boy. Would y'all agree? But he was born in sin. He was born in sin. He was born a sinner. Yes, sir. He was born a sinner. Now, now when he's a baby... And he doesn't realize what sin is, he's not accountable. You say, Brother Troy, where's the scripture? I say, Brother, you look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 when David sinned. The Bible said that David's firstborn child was taken from him because he had sinned. The Bible says, Shall I bring him back? He said, I can't bring him back. I'll go to him. So that tells me that babies go to heaven before they know what sin is. But when you know what sin is, when you know what sin is, you're held accountable for that sin. You are held accountable for that sin, and I want you to know that God's made a way for you to be saved. God has made a way for you to be saved because, brother, the wages of sin is death. God's Word cannot change God said that in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. You, Brother, you will die for your sin. God's made a way. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Did you, did you see that right there? Righteousnesses. It didn't just say righteousness. It says righteousness is all of the good things. It was the tree not only of the knowledge of evil, but it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's our righteousnesses oftentimes that are deceptive to mankind. There are people, and I mean morally, ethically good people who are on their way to hell right now. Brother, they are walking the path of Satan and they don't even know it. They have been blinded. They are good people. They are sweet people. 
But brother, their righteousness does not save them. The righteousnesses of mankind does not save them. You can give all that you want to give to the church. You can read all that you want to read. You can be born and brought up in the church. But brother, until you realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that God Himself shed His blood, and I do believe that Jesus' blood was God's blood. I believe it was God's blood. I don't believe that it was man's blood. I believe it was God's blood in Jesus. God shed His blood for you and I willfully so that you would be saved. God's made it easy. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. We all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages are things that you earn. Wages are things that you earn. The most that you can earn in your goodness is death. The most that you can earn in your righteousness is death. That's, that is the most you can earn. You can be a good old boy. I mean, I'm talking a good old boy. I mean, you give your truck to your neighbor, you'd go and you'd help your neighbor and you'd do anything. You'd give him the shirt off your back. It won't save you. The most you can earn is death. It's not me who said it. Who said it? Who said it? God said it. God said the wages of sin is death. Not me. God said it. And what, did, what happens when God says something? It happens. It can't be changed. It cannot be changed. The most you can earn in righteousness is death. And your righteousness is death. But the gift of God. Aren't you glad it's a gift? Hallelujah. God loves to give gifts. He loves to give gifts. Man can... You say, well, Brother Troy, what if I just choose to pay for my sin? You know, the brother, there are many men of valor who have died in wars who have fought for our country. And brother, they deserve honor. But it didn't save them. There are people, there are policemen, there are firemen who go charging into a building, who go charging into a crime scene, brother, wearing a bulletproof vest, and they go in there and they pay for it with their lives. And if they have not trusted the blood of Jesus Christ, they'll split hell wide open. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You say, Brother Troy, what's charity? Well, I give to the charity all the time. That's not the kind of charity. You need to study the Bible. You need to find out what it means. It's agape. It's God's love for mankind. Though I have not God's love for mankind in my heart, and give my body to be burned, it profits me nothing. Nothing. Not that. You must have the love of God. You say, well, brother, what's the love of God? God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you see, God didn't just say, well, I love you. You ever have somebody tell you, you love, that, that, that they love you and then they turn around and stab you in the back or something? I mean, it's happened, hasn't it? You see, God, God doesn't, God doesn't, God didn't just say, I love you. God commended his love. God put his love into action. And he sent his son Jesus Christ, whom even the historians say he was here. Even the sinners, they know he was here. They know he walked this earth. I tell you that there's more. Jesus never went to college. But there's been more colleges and universities founded in His name than any other person. Jesus never wrote a song. But there's been more beautiful songs written and sang about Him than any other person that's ever lived. More than the Beatles. More than Elvis Presley. More than any other kind of famous singer. Jesus. They've written it about Him. Jesus never wrote a book other than the Word of God. But there's been more books authored about Him than any other person in history. Any other person. 
I tell you, Jesus walked this earth just like you and I did. And now he sits at the right hand of God. God commended his love toward us when we were good. God commended his love toward us when we were righteous. No, God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. I tell you, if you've not accepted the blood of Jesus as your salvation, you're a sinner here this morning, and you'll stand in judgment. You will stand in judgment, and you'll not go to heaven if you've not accepted the blood of Jesus as your salvation. There's no other way. You say, Brother Troy, I'm a good guy. Brother, God didn't say be a good guy, you go to heaven. God said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God said, Brother, you're accountable this morning for what you hear. I didn't just come this morning to have a good time, and brother, I do have a good time at church. Hallelujah. But I came this morning because I love Jesus. And I've come because of the truth of God. And brother, this is just a type. This is just a shadow of what's to come. It's coming. Glory be to God. God committed His love toward us when we were sinners. You see, our blood is filthy. Our blood is dirty. But Jesus' blood was innocent blood. His blood was pure. That's why a man can't say, well, I'll, my daddy, my daddy will save me. My daddy's a strong man. My daddy's a, a, a hard-working man. And he'll know your daddy's blood is corrupt. Your daddy's blood is tainted with sin. Jesus' blood is innocent. I tell you, the, one of the most innocent thing that my eyes ever behold is a baby. To see, to see a baby who's not been corrupted by sin in this world and is, and is not, their, their mind hasn't been corrupted by someone who has treated them wrong or said something wrong to them or, or has led them in the wrong path. But brother, the, the smile on their face and the, and the, the, the countenance that shines on their precious little face. Uh, brother, it's so innocent and it's so pure. Brother, that's how Jesus was when He was 33 years old. That's how Jesus was when He was betrayed by Judas. The Bible says here that Judas came to Him and He said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. He didn't say, I betrayed innocent blood because I want you to know there is no other innocent blood. There is no other innocent blood. He said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. The innocent blood is God's blood. You know what the devil said to him? What is that to us? See thou to it. Brother, you might think that the world is your friend. And you might have some good old buddies that you hang out with. And you think they're your friend. And that they'll help you out. But I tell you, when it really comes down to it, and their soul's on the line at Judgment Day, they'll say, what is that to us? See now to it. That's exactly what the devil will do. They'll say, what's that to me? You made your choice. You made your choice to walk that way. Brother, it's a choice that you have to make personally. I can't do it for you. If I could, oh, I would. I would. I would, I would bow down to God, and I would pray for a week straight if I could for you to be saved. But listen, it's a choice you have to make. You have to say it. You have to call on Him. I've sinned in that I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See, they'll tell it. His blood was innocent. There is no other innocent blood. Not only was it innocent, but it was precious. Precious blood. See, there's no other blood that's like that. Jesus' blood it's not something that could be bought, trade, traded for, or sold. And that's what the Bible tells us here in 1 Peter. God says that we are to be holy because He is holy. He says, If ye call on the Father without respect of persons, judge it according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. What that means without respect of persons, God does not... It, God does not care if you are a diplomat, if you are a president, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're white. God does not have no respected persons. 
God is looking for one thing. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Here it is again. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of this world, but was manifest in these last times for you. I tell you that we're living in the last of the last times. And Jesus is coming back. You say, Brother Troy, I'm a young, I'm young, I'm a little boy, I'm a little girl, I'm a young man, I'm a teenager. I got plenty of time. Don't you count on it. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God shall sound. Yeah. It's going to happen like that. It's going to happen like that. You'll not have time to be, get prepared. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I've heard thee and accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. You've heard the truth today. You have heard the truth of God's salvation. To by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. I tell you, it's wonderful to have the hope of God. It is one brother, it is it is peace that passes all understanding. And brother, whether there's a nuclear war tomorrow, whether the stock market crashes, whether we all go into poverty and sickness. I know one thing, that whereas I was blind, yet now I see. And brother, I'm going to see Jesus. Amen. I'm going to go to heaven. Amen. And it don't matter what this whole world throws at me. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I tell you that He is El Shaddai. He supplies my every need. Hallelujah. He furnishes me with the Word of God. He fills me with the Holy Spirit. He tells me that I'm His Son. And there is no man that can take that from me. No man can take your joy from you. That's right. Amen. No man. His blood was precious. I tell you that it's wonderful to be saved. So I ask you today, do you choose Jesus? Do you choose Jesus? This, this is not a half-hearted answer. This is not a half-hearted acceptance. Either you choose Jesus or you choose death. It's that plain and simple. Will you choose Jesus? You see, after we sin, for if after we if we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sin. God says that there's a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. We shall devour the adversaries. God says that there's judgment coming, and He says, brother, if you have not accepted the blood of Jesus. You should be afraid. You should be afraid this morning. You should be afraid for your very soul. But glory be to God. I'm glad that God is not a God who wants us to live in fear. Because perfect love, His perfect love casts out all of our fear. The Bible says here that he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall we be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done them despite under the Spirit of grace. You see, even back in the Old Testament, when the destroyer would come through where the children of Israel were, God told them to take a lamb and to take that blood and to put it on the doorpost and on the lintels. And brother, if you think about that, that is a symbol of the cross. Even all the way back in the book of Exodus, God was pointing them to the cross. He says, you put that blood over your door of your house and I'll not suffer the destroyer to come in. I'll pass over you, God says, and I'll protect you. I'll not suffer him to come in. Ray Ray read the scripture this morning. Yes. He is the horn of my salvation. He is, he is the horn. He will fight for you. He will fight for you. Brother, he'll move heaven and earth for you yes. if you only trust him. If you only call upon him. If you only believe and say, would you save me? Lord, 
and I love you. I thank you that you died for me. Would you save me? It's that simple. It's that simple as well. I'm so glad. There's power in the blood. It still hasn't changed. It's still the same today as it was the day that Jesus shed His blood on the cross for us to be saved. Would you bow your heads with me, please, as we pray? Father God, Lord, I just want to praise You and thank You for all that You have given us, dear Lord God, and Your Son. Father God, Lord, Your Gospel, that Father never changes, that You're the same today, yesterday, and forever. I pray this morning, Father God, Lord, if there be any here this morning that aren't saved, that haven't trusted the blood of Jesus, maybe they've attended church, Maybe they've known about you, Father God, but Lord, they, they have not trusted and had faith in your blood, Father, for their salvation. I pray, dear Lord, that you would open their eyes. Father, that you would show them the truth that Christ shed his blood on the cross and that by simply trusting in him and what he has done for us, Father, that we can be saved. Father, I pray, dear Lord God, that that you continue to work on us. Those of us that are saved, continue to work on us. Help us, dear Lord, to be purified. Lord God, that you would guide us in the right paths. Father, for your name's sake. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you don't know the pardon and forgiveness of God's blood, I want to encourage you to come this morning. Maybe, maybe, you've, maybe you've known about Jesus, but you just... God has showed you something new today. God has opened your eyes to what the blood of Christ really means. Won't you come this morning and confess Him? Come this morning and confess Him and He'll pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain. So if someone would, maybe find us a song of invitation. If you want to be saved this morning, you can come. You know, brother, even if today if you're, if you're sick and you have an infirmity, you can come. Because the Bible said that it was by His stripes that we were healed. You see, brother, Jesus is still the same. And His blood has the power of salvation and it has the power of cleansing for our soul and spirit. So won't you come this morning? Won't you come to Him? Don't come to me and don't come to an altar, but come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and come to the cross. Call upon His name. Brother, as we, we saw, you could be in a mountain somewhere and pray. You could be, you could be anywhere in this world and you can call upon the name of the Lord. You could be laying upon your bed and you can call upon the name of the Lord. But I want you to know one thing. That if you truly trust Jesus, if you truly call upon Him for salvation, you'll not be ashamed of Him around men. You'll not be ashamed of Jesus. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and in the presence of His angels. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. Would you ask Him this morning for your help? Would you ask Him for your salvation? Someone have a song? 33, you wake up. Come this morning and we can pray together. I'll pray with you if you want to come. I can't save you. I can't do anything for you, but I can I can pray to my Heavenly Father and He can help you with whatever infirmity you have if you'll come this morning. Maybe, maybe you maybe you need more faith and you want God to add to your faith. God will help your faith in the blood of Jesus. Help thou my unbelief, the man said. Why don't you come this morning?